I'm a media artist, uh, educator, and PhD student here at York. Uh, my doctoral research creation work explores the poetics of VR using an experimental structuralist approach uh, informed by media arts uh, from the 60s and 70s. It's uh, research that's supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And today I'm going to be discussing uh, my latest work after Dan Graham with a focus on how I view the work through the lens of research creation. So I'm going to start with a brief description of the work, along with a brief description of the work this work is based on. And I'll touch on how I believe this work of research creation generates knowledge, um, just what kind of knowledge that might be and why that knowledge might be valuable for helping us think through or understand the kinds of challenges posed by the immersive media technology we've been talking about today. <clears throat> so After Dan Graham is a uh, mixed reality art installation and experimental virtual reality experience. The project was born out of a desire to investigate the poetics of VR and seeks to examine the creative potential inherent in VR's ability to create affective kinesthetic experiences. I'm wondering if we could run that video, the first one. <clears throat> the installation takes place inside a single room which is empty save for four uh, monitors, two mounted on one side and the other two mounted on the opposite side. Um, maybe we should just pause that, that's a little nauseating. <laughs> um, the installation takes place inside a single room. Um, the single participant is invited to put on a VR headset, carry two hand controllers, and put on VR trackers on both their uh, waist and their feet. And inside the virtual reality environment, uh, the participant is placed inside the body of a featureless humanoid avatar whose movements correspond directly to the movement of the participant. Looking around, they see a recreation of Dan Graham's video art installation time delay room one. And every 16 seconds after the VR experience begins, a new virtual agent spawns in the initial location of the participant. And as shown, uh, what you're looking at here is um, this virtual agent that spawns looks identical to the participant's avatar, and its movements are based on the movement of the participant on a 16 second delay. So over time, the room becomes populated with a crowd of virtual agents, all echoing the past movements of the VR participant. Slide. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, those outside of the virtual environment, not wearing the headset, are free to move around the installation and observe both the VR participant and the four monitors. Um, these monitors display the same images as the four monitors inside the virtual environment. So two of them are showing a live camera feed of the virtual environment, and two are showing those same feeds but on an eight second delay. And in this way, these monitors provide our sort of windows into the virtual environment, an environment that sort of exists as a uh, virtual palimpsest of the actual environment in front of them. The installation is, on which this work is based is uh, Time Delay Room 1, a closed circuit video installation created by American artist Dan Graham in 1974. And as seen in this illustration, the installation featured two identical rooms, each surveilled by a closed circuit video camera, cameras A and B. And in each room were two monitors. One monitor displayed the real-time video feed of the other room. The other monitor displayed the video feed of the current room on an eight second delay. In Time Delay Room 1, Dan Graham explored the unique ability of video to capture, transmit, and display real-time moving images. He was interested in the way that the unique temporality of video, as instantiated in this sort of closed circuit video feedback loop, could be employed to alter a person's sense of self-perception. And so he writes, if a perceiver views this behavior on a five to eight second delay vid via videotape, so his responses are part of and influencing his perception, private mental intention and external behavior is fed back on the monitor and immediately influences the observer's future intentions and behavior. By linking perception of exterior behavior and its interior mental perception, an observer's self, like a topological Mobius strip, can be apparently without inside or outside. 
video feedback time is the immediate present without relation to past and hypothetical future states, a continuous topological or feedback loop forward or backward between just past and immediate present. And I think this is um, a familiar feeling for anyone who's ever gone money at the bank machine. You see yourself on the camera and there's this sort of moment where it's, you're sort of inside and out of your side yourself at the same time. I think that's sort of what he's describing here. <clears throat> so, um, Graham argues that the unique ability of a closed circuit television system to externalize a perception of ourselves results in the collapse of interior mental perception and exterior behavior. And this creates a sort of unique form of temporality that he calls video feedback time. In time delay room one, he pushed this unique temporality into the physical space of the gallery. So what we're seeing here is a documentation of um, an installation of this, of Graham's original work uh, at ZKM in, uh, in 2001. <clears throat> in doing so, it only became activated in the presence of a participant. And this created conditions under which the collapse of subject and object, interior and exterior, private and public, could only be understood through the participant's embodied presence. In writing about closed circuit video installation art, media theorist Margaret Morse argues that the extension of the temporality of the video apparatus into physical space is the raison d'etre of this type of art. She says, while an installation can be diagrammed, photographed, videotaped, or described in language, its crucial element is miss ultimately missing from any such two-dimensional construction, that is, the space in between, or the actual construction of a passage for bodies or figures in space and time. Indeed, I argue, the part that collapses whenever the installation isn't installed is the art. <clears throat> And Morse uh, argues that the affective experience of closed circuit video installation art lies not in the content of the medium, but rather in the encounter of medium and body. And she concludes that the underlying premise of the installation appears to be that the audiovisual experience supplemented kinesthetically can be a kind of learning, not with the mind alone, but with the body itself. And that this learning occurs at the level of the body ego and its orientation in space. And it's this kind of learning this kind of embodied knowledge that the research emerging from after Dan Graham produces. In that sense, it's much different than the kind of knowledge that other more traditional research methods might produce. <clears throat> Writing about this difference uh, in the kind of knowledge that research creation produces, media archeologist Wolfgang Ernst writes, academic media theory brings out the epistemological surplus which is dormant within media technologies. Knowledge needs to become explicit in order to become reflective. And this primarily takes place in the medium of verbal text, the classical cultural technology as practiced in universities. Different from that logocentristic explication of knowledge, there is implicit knowledge, and here he's making a reference to um, Michael Pollyani's um, idea of tacit knowledge. Um, and this knowledge stays in a kind of latency within, within the media. Artistic practice can evoke this implicit episteme to create affective forms of insight. But both academics and artists must be tuned in the right way to be able to resonate with that knowledge. And I, I really like this quote because I think it speaks to what happens in After Dan Graham. I see this work as creating the conditions for participants to both consider the implicit or tacit knowledge rooted in their very own bodies by confronting them with that data they impart through the use of the VR technology. And so, um, this is the third clip, <clears throat> if we can play it. Hopefully it won't be uh, <laughs> great. Well, that's too bad. Um, on this latter point, the pro <laughs> wow. On this latter point, the project's use of the feedback loop to incarnate a participant's corporeal data in the form of a population of virtual agents expand subjectivity beyond the participant's virtual body into a multiplicity of exterior observable bodies, foregrounding the internal operations and unique temporality of the VR apparatus, and making evident the corporeal data that is the very foundation of VR. Indeed, the data collected by the surveillance of the body of the participant is fundamental to the creation of the illusion of immersion within the virtual environment. We simply cannot have VR without this data. <clears throat> now, 
This also suggests that the structuralist approaches of the artists of the 60s and 70s, whose work foregrounded the materiality and temporality of the time-based media with which they worked, are important, perhaps even vital, for understanding contemporary emerging media technology. Furthermore, after Dan Graham virtually recreates what Morse called the space in between offered by the original artwork, the multiple virtual agents that populate the virtual environment are felt as much as they are seen. And echoing Morse's sentiment regarding the closed circuit installation art of the 60s and 70s, the part that collapses whenever the VR headset is taken off is the art. And this positions closed circuit video installation art as a sort of proto VR and suggests that the affective potential of VR lies not solely in what is represented, but rather in the encounter between body and media content. Thanks. <laughs>